Amalek. And as there is not here under thine hand spear or sword, for I neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth between the ephod. And thou wilt take, take, if thou wilt take that, take it. For there is no other save that here. And David said, There are none other, none like it. Give it to me. Turn over to another page to chapter 22, verse 10. Chapter 22, verse 10. And he inquired of the Lord for him, and gave him victuals, and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. This is a. Uh, this was one of the, the messages that we had over the the uh, cooped up time. During that time, we uh, we trimmed everything down a little bit so it would stay on the on the uh, schedule right and everything. So you get the full fledged version this morning. The um, the story you know the story of David and Goliath is sort of like David and Goliath. <laughs> Four ten. David was four ten. And Goliath was how, how tall are you? Six, two. Goliath was six two. So, I, I, doesn't it say Goliath was like nine foot tall or something like that? I don't know. I didn't. I didn't. I, I should have. Don't, don't don't ask any kind of question. Yet. Yeah. Eight feet tall. That's big. That's big. You must have feet on that big long. Anyhow, down you 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 deer hunters can familiarize with this a little bit better than anybody else. There's a there's a, a, a field on this side and a field on this side and a gully in between, a ravine. And if you're not careful, the people on this side, after a deer, can shoot the people on this side after a deer. And if you're not careful, the deer will go and there'll be people laying all over the place. That's how they hunt in West Virginia, I'm told. <laughs> yeah, probably so. <laughs> oh, Lena's here, and she's graduating this year. Let's give Lena a hand for graduating. That was sort of that was sort of cool how they did that this year. I, I mean, it wasn't as cool as being in the school, I'm sure, but but it was uh, it was pretty neat. Have her explain that to you after the service, if you would. That was that was cool. I followed it on Facebook, so. Anyhow, on this side was the Philistine army. The Philistine army, you go through the word of God, one of the most, one of the greatest, no, one of the most horrible enemies of God's army was always the Philistine army. The Philistine army on this side, the ravine here, and God's army on this side. Goliath, the big giant guy, the eight and a half foot tall guy, on the Philistine side, kept hollering across the ravine to the to the Israel Israelite side. It was a, it was an admirable thing for him to do, even though he was the the meanie. He uh, hey over there, I'm the champion over here. I'm the big shot. I'm the big cheese. Here's the deal. You pick a big cheese, which probably is a little cheese. On your side, me, the big cheese, and he, the little cheese, will fight. And whoever wins that battle between us two wins the war. Sounds like a pretty good deal. Instead of hundreds and thousands of people dying in this battle, only one was going to die for sure. And Goliath, for sure, knew it was going to be him that was going to survive. The Israelite army looked around and they seen little puny guys all over the place. Nobody big enough to fight, fight Goliath. Nobody volunteered. Down yonder a ways, David was tending a flock of sheep and his father, Jesse, comes to him and says, David, I've got some lunch here. I want you to take it down and give it to your brothers in the army. So they can make, so they can have something to eat for lunch. So David packs up the stuff that his father gave him. Now here's here's where your Bible 
is a little bit different than my Bible, though we have the same King James Version probably for the most part. My Bible has a little, that much Greek in it. So you'll not find this in your Bible. In my Bible, it says what was in this lunch basket. There was spaghetti. It's, it's in here. It's in here. I'll show it to you afterwards. There's, that's in the Greek. There was spaghetti, a salad with what kind of dressing? Ranch. Italian dressing. Or ranch. Or ranch. There's um, chocolate cake, peanut butter icing. There's a Dr. Pepper in there. There's a bag of hard pretzels. There's a bag of licorice and a box of nerves. And let me tell you, that's preaching now. You'll not find that in your Bible. And for you that's listening on the tape, don't, don't tell anybody I said that. Jesse said, take this down to your, to your brothers and feed them. David, I think, don't hold me to it, but I think David's a, a middle teenager. At the most, he's 16. I, I'm thinking he's either 13 or 14 during this time. And he comes down to this, this the battlefield, and he hears this giant over there fussing back and forth with God's, God's army. So he goes to his brothers and says, uh, who's going to fight that big ox? He's got, a pretty, uh, he's got a pretty loud mouth. Somebody needs to set him straight. Well, David, we don't have anybody big enough to do it. David said, well, I'll do it. <laughs> David, you're not even in the army. Matter of fact, you didn't, you got, you, you flunked out of the Boy Scouts. But you don't know, brothers. See these hands? I killed a bear. And I killed a lion with these bare hands. Both of them. Well, let's take him to King Saul and see what Saul says. So they take, they, they scarf up David, they take him to the king, and King Saul says, You gotta be kidding. You gotta be kidding. That eight foot tall guy and this four foot ten guy over here is gonna fight, and they're gonna Kingy. See these hands? I fought a bear and I beat him. I fought a lion and I scunned him. And I can fight that big ox over there and I can beat him also. King Saul says, well, if, I guess it's worth a shot. Here, take my armor, take my shield, take my sword, take my spear, and David said, I, I, I can't wear that stuff. It's too, it, it'd be like me trying to fit in Steve's shirt. <laughs> Can you imagine me fitting in Steve's shirt? If I'd have thought about it earlier, I did think about it earlier, but I was about half embarrassed to ask you. I was going to ask you to bring another shirt along. I was going to put it on. He said, it's too clumsy. It's too awkward. It's too big. I can't, I can't fight with, them, with that, that stuff on. Well, how are you going to fight? What are you going to do? Well, it just so happens, Kingy, that I'm pretty good with this slingshot. I have practiced and I've practiced, and I'm just pretty good with it. So David goes out, picks up five stones. The Bible says he picks up five stones out of the field, and he stands up toward this giant. Someone said, to me recently, why, if if God was going to fail, and you know the story, so some of this you're, you're reading ahead of me. It's like somebody knowing the movie before they get to that part, and they're saying the part, and you're ruining it for you. If you're going to fail the giant with one stone, why did he need five? Anybody know why he needed five? Brothers. Because in Second Samuel it says Goliath had four giant relatives, and he figured he'd have to kill all. Five. That is exactly right. <laughs> He had four, did it say relatives or brothers? It was brothers, cousins, uncle, I can't remember 
he had four relatives, and he thought, if I killed Goliath, for sure, I'm going to have to kill these other four also. So he picks up five stones, and he goes up towards Goliath, and Goliath makes fun of him. I got this sword, I got this spear, I got this armor, and look at you, you're a little, you're, you're a little wee puny guy. Look at them muscles on you. Now you can't compare them to mine. Mine's so big. <laughs> what are we going to do here? Well, we're going to fight. And you're going down, big guy. So David, you know the story. Goliath starts toward David. David starts toward Goliath. And Goliath slinged, slinged, slunged, slung. He threw this rock out of this slingshot toward the giant and lo and behold the giant fell dead one rock he didn't need the other four brother he goes up to Goliath follow me now this is all introduction I'm going to preach here in a couple minutes I told you I told you about cutting the time short during the taping I, I got all kind of time this morning I, I think I think the sermon is about three hours long so you ordered pizza for one o'clock, right? <laughs> he goes up. He straddles the giant. He takes Goliath's sword. Follow me now. He takes Goliath's sword and he cuts the head off of Goliath with his sword. Remember that. That's important. David soon finds himself in trouble with King Saul. As soon as that happens, all the women in the nation becomes friends with, with David. Oh boy, you're a big, tall, handsome guy now. Four foot ten tall. You're bigger than four foot ten. I love you. <laughs> well, King Saul didn't like it because they loved him first. Now they, they, they love uh, David, but they don't love King Saul anymore. So King Saul gets a, um, what do they call that when they, in the gangster days? Hit when you want, a hitman. King Saul gets a hitman. Thank you, sister. King Saul gets a hitman, and he's going to kill David. David says, I know what's going to happen. So he, he takes off. He takes off running. He takes off running so fast, the Bible says he made haste. Didn't want to mess around. He made haste. He took off. He didn't take any weapons along with him. Didn't have any way to, to de defend himself. He gets out along the path. And he um, realizes that he's going to need something to defend himself with. There's wild animals and wild people and wild and wonderful. So he stops at this place along the road. And there's a priest there. And he says to the priest... Bless you. He says to the priest, do you have any weapons? Well, it just so happens I have this one weapon, and you know all about it because you used it on Goliath. It's his sword. And I'm not going to sell it to you, but I'll give it to you. You can have it. You can take it along with you if you want, if you want to. It's the same one you used to chop his head off with. I'll take it. I'll take it. He starts down the road with his sword in hand, and that's where I want to start to preach from this morning. Goliath's sword, follow me now. Goliath's sword, the threat from Goliath's sword, or Goliath's sword itself, will sooner or later come up against you. I don't know how it will come up against you. Maybe it'll come up against you as a broken heart. Maybe it'll come up against you as old age. Maybe it'll come up against you as cancer. We have, at that moment, a choice to make. What we should, should say when these things come up against us, when these giants pop out over the hills, what we should say is sword. What we should say is 
Goliath, you're not going to win out in this battle. I'm going to use that which was supposed to be against me, against the enemy, and I'm going to win the battle. It may be the flu. It may be the virus. It may be one on a deathbed. It may be a car crash that happens quickly. You say to that Goliath this morning, you can try and you can try, hear me now, you can try all you want, you can make all the threats you want, car crash, you can, you can put all the cells in me you want, cancer, you can try and you can try and you can try, and you might even knock me down a peg or two, but you will not win this battle. I'm going to win the war. It's been months ago. I got a phone call. I didn't answer it. I told, I told you before. I don't answer the phone if it doesn't come up your name. If it comes up just a number, I don't answer the phone. If it comes up anything other than a, a name that I know, I don't answer the phone. So it rang, and I didn't answer it. Just left it go. About a half hour later, a text come through with the same net, with the same number on that the phone rang before. And I thought, well, it must be something pretty important, maybe. So I gets up out of bed in the middle of the dark, and when you don't see colors, it's hard to see what you're doing in the middle of the night. I stepped on the dog, and the dog went, Row! Oh, I hope we don't start that bird hog. <laughs> Scared the daylights out of me. Got my little, my little, my phone off the, the edge of the bed. Starting to look through the numbers in it. And it comes to find out it was a, a young man that I had in our church a few years back before that. So I called him. All this was happening, I, I, I don't know. I think it was 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. Mostly when your phone rings at 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, it's not good. It's not good. So I called him back and he said, Pastor John, I want to thank you for preaching at me the way you preached at me years ago because I got saved. I thought, 1.30 in the morning? I said, you mean I was preaching to you? He said, no, you were preaching at me. And I was mad at the time. I thought you were looking in my windows. I thought you were a mind reader at the time. He said, I'm a pastor now. And my church is celebrating five years of anniversary of me being there. And we're having a, a special week in September. And I want you to come to Indiana. There's nothing good in Indiana, Dave. <laughs> you, you, put, you put Indiana and New Jersey together and shake them up, you can't tell the difference. And I have a son who lives in New Jersey. Brother, it's even worse than West Virginia. He said, I want you to come to Indiana. We're having a week full of services. I want you to preach two nights, if you will. I said, I don't know about that. Because you were pretty bad when you were in church. I was just... I was just teasing with him. I said, I'll, I'll absolutely do it. I'll absolutely do it. He, um, give me the dates. We hung up. Two nights later, two nights later, this name comes across the phone again. And I, first, first thing I thought was, he probably changed his mind. He remembered that time I did something to him. He didn't like it. Now he's going to cancel it. So I, this time I answered the phone and he said, Pastor, I, I, want you to, I want you to pray for me and I want you to pray right now. He said, we took our son. Our son has, is prone to ear infection since he was born. We took our son to the urgent care with what we thought was an ear infection and just about the time that I opened the door to go into the, into the urgent care, he died in my arms. And there I was holding my dead boy. 
2 o'clock in the morning. And I thought, my soul, my soul, what's going to happen next? Everything going well. Church throwing him a big week of celebration. That's one time that I would have liked to have had a pilot's license and a private jet because I'd have, I'd have been on that thing and been to Indiana real quick. I said, Pastor, what are you going to do? You're not going to give up, are you? He said, no, we're not going to give up. He said, in fact, we started a group for parents that have lost children, young children. And the other night, the other night, we had a meeting and 13 people joined the group after they got saved at the group meeting. He said, Preacher, you remember the story? Brother Jeff might remember it. You remember the story that you used to always tell about the monkey and the alligator? You remember that? Where the monkey, the alligator claws come down. And they'll bite your head right off. Little beady eyes. Little beady eyes. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Serena remembers it. No, I did that on purpose that time. <laughs> <laughs> now watch that'll be it um, he said in your honor we named the support group when the alligator bites the alligator had bitten him took his little boy what just happened he took the sword that was meant to hurt him, and he turned around and he attacked his enemy with it. And 13 people got saved. It's hard to tell what's happening from now, from then on. I shared with you before Richard Nixon's my favorite president. Bless his heart. I know he's I know he resigned. I know he was going to be impeached. But Mr. Nixon said one of the most profound statements, and I want you to hear it well. Lenny, you're going to school, you're going to college. It won't always be hip, hip, hooray, I'm sure. Mr. Nixon said, a man is not finished, a lady is not finished when he or she is defeated. A man is finished when he quits. He's not defeated when, he's not finished when, he, when he's defeated. He's finished when he quits. And we'll at times, I could start with Josh and go to Mr. Buck and everybody in between. We at times will get beat down, won't we? We'll, we'll be the ones that gets the bucket kicked out from underneath our feet. Instead of praying for someone else, we'll need them praying for us. And I could, I could tell you I, I, won't, I won't do it because I know you could too. I could tell you story after story of times that I almost quit. Come that close. But different times when I felt like quitting, mm -hmm. I looked up and saw my Jesus hanging on the cross. And I realized that what little piddly bit I'm going through was worth it to call him the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I picked up Goliath's sword and used it against my enemies. And now that's what I want you to do today. Because Goliath's sword is already, or it will be, coming to your house pretty soon. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. If old smutty face hasn't attacked you yet, he's mounting an attack right now. 
He will. When that happens, you got a decision to make. You're either going to blame someone else for everything that's going on. You're going to quit, throw in the towel, Brother Denny, Amen. Sister Sherry, or you're going to pick up Goliath's sword and say, oh, my face, you're not going to win this battle. I'm going to win out over you. You might knock me down, and you might stand, you might stamp on me, but you're not going to win. I'm going to pick up this sword that was meant to hurt me, and I'm going to hurt you, enemy. I'm going to fight you, devil. Jim Valvano, the famous basketball coach for North Carolina State, said in his famous speech in the Espies, he said, don't give up, don't you ever give up. As he stood there, had to be held up by a couple of his friends dying with cancer. He took Goliath's sword, the same sword that was used against him, and stood for God. You that are older, and Sierra. Ron Hamilton. Anybody here Ron Hamilton except Sierra? I figured not. Am I that old? How, how do you fit in the same Is that past the fire? That? Ron Hamilton that went to the eye doctor. And the eye doctor said, you have cancer in your right eye. That's it. I have no faith in God. I have no faith in the doctors. I have no faith in this office. He gave up on God, cursed God, wished he was dead. No, he didn't. He went to the, he went to the store and he got himself a patch to put it over his eye and he became Patch the Pirate and thousands and hundreds of thousands of kids got saved because of his stories and because of his songs on, on cassette tape. That shows you something right there, cassette tape. I have cassette tapes of the giggy of Patch the Pirate. He took Goliath's sword and he fought Goliath with all that he had. I'm saying when you're, when you're caught between a rock and a hard place, and some of us are there right now, when you're caught between that rock and the hard place, do what David did. Take up, take up giant, the, the giant's sword, straddle that giant, cut his head off, and proclaim to God that you're the winner. That you're the winner. You'll not be defeated as long as you don't quit. Preacher, what, what, what do you do first? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's what you do first. I promise you I'll get you out of here in the next 10 minutes or less. At first, you just hurt a while. Now, Linda, don't put the stopwatch on me now. I see you're looking. At first, you just hurt. I mean, you lost a family member. You got a disease. At first, you just hurt a while. That's all you can do. My pastor friend didn't say, Glory to God, hallelujah, my baby's dead. And the preacher don't have a preacher to run to. And I couldn't get there for him if I wanted to in any time frame. So he heard a while. What did he do? Secondly, you try to find a way out of it. After you try to find a way out of it, you realize that you can't find a way out of it on your own. You have to turn to God. You look down. It's always there. It's always there. You look down, and lo and behold, there lies, guess what? Goliath's sword. So you look at it. That sword laying there that was going to be used against you may, may represent a single mom with all kinds of heartaches. It may, it may represent a widow or an orphan, a certain illness. But good night in the morning, folks. Don't let that sword lay there my Bible says I'm to pick it up and I'm to use it against my enemy. He's attacked you. He's attacked me time and time again over the, over the last decade, I'm sure. But I've learned, like all preachers learn, 
like all parishioners learn, sometimes the hard way, to hate losing with a passion. I just, I just, I just hate to lose. I just hate to lose. I don't care what, it, what it's about. Sierra, your kids get in a race with me, and one of them gets in the way, they're going to get run over. There's no doubt about it. I don't care if it's Avery, Lincoln, or John. Get out of the way, punk. That's it. I mean, I can find two, I can find two ladybugs on the windowsill and push them along and have races. I just, I just hate to lose. I just hate to lose. I hate to throw in the towel. I was given, he, he's not here again. That old guy gets me just all the time. I, just, just, all, just all the time. He wasn't here the day we were doing it in, in the, whenever we were cooped up. Whenever the wife passed, someone came and said, you, uh, you should take a couple weeks off. Brother Mike Lyons shows up. And he gave me some of the most, some of the best advice that anybody's ever given me. And he might not remember it. But he said, and I'm telling, I'm saying to you this morning, he said to me, if you're waiting to heal, you won't. If you're waiting to get over it, you won't get over it completely. But he said, you got to keep going. You got to keep going. There's no choice. I've used that advice. I hope you don't charge me for it. Just like him to charge me for it. I've used that advice hundreds of times. That's not stretching it a bit. Brother Denny? I'm running out of body parts. I, I understand that, but you're, the part of the body parts you're, that you have are coming back. When, whenever Brother Denny calls, I just realize that God's still in the miracle working business. Sister Sherry, bless your heart. We're standing behind you 100%. And we're going to fight the devil with you. We're going to fight the devil with you. And lo and behold, we're going to win. Amen. We're going to win. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you would be with us in a special way, that you would cause us to realize as long as we have, have, have you on our side, the victory is ours. Yeah, we'll get knocked down here and there, but our hands are going to be raised as winners in the end. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not sure. The first thing to be sure of is that you're ready to go to heaven. If you're not positive that you are, be saved right now. No set words, no set prayer. Just ask the Lord to come into your heart and save your soul. Thank you for doing it. That's all it takes. That's all, that's all you need to do. Maybe you're here and that's settled. There's no doubt about it. And you're under attack by, by old smutty face. Or you're under attack by Goliath, one of, his, one of his giant people. One of his giant problems that poked his head up. Whether you're here in the service here or whether you're home this morning, I, I challenge us to not leave where we're at, to not stop what you're doing without turning everything you have over to God. Because the statement is still true, if, if God be for us, who can be against us? Father, I pray that before we leave here, every single person would be saved and be ready for Jesus to come back. I pray that every saved person would have their battles and realize that God's on their side and they're going to win. They're going to win. Thank you, Jesus, for saving our soul. 
Thank you, Jesus, for helping us win our, win our fights more than once. I pray now that you would be with us as we fellowship around the tables for our busy time and bless those that are traveling across the highways and that are headed home. Keep us safe all week and bring us back again next week is our prayer. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.